time in Ireland's defence discussions is on the proposed Commission on Defence in the programme for government. Um, so we want to make sure that there's a discussion on that. And that's what we're starting today. I want to really thank our panellists who are um, an esteemed group of academics. And we see this as being the start in a series of discussions on the proposed uh, Commission on Defence. So the first one is tonight with our five academics. We, in another few weeks, we'll do one with some ex-military people. And after that, we hope to bring and invite in some political people to share their thoughts on it. Um, we have over 180 participants registered for this event. So that is the biggest event we've ever had with the club. So thank you all very much. And it shows the interest that people have in this topic, I think. Um, we can't possibly coordinate uh, questions and answers from the floor because of that number of people. So I'd advise you to just look at the Q&A function, either at the top right or bottom right of your screen, depending on, on your operating system. Please submit questions in there and we, I'll do my best to get them to the speakers as we go on throughout the night. Uh, we'll also be posting some polls, so please give your opinion. Uh, they'll be anonymous, so please feel free to vote any way you want. Uh, and then that in itself, we might be able to share some of the results of those polls on social media. Um, the format tonight is that each of our esteemed speakers will have eight to ten minutes to talk about their specific topic. Um, and we'll do that one after the other. And at the end of each of their speakers, we'll, we'll be at probably about 8 p.m. And then from 8 p.m. until 8.30, we will encourage a discussion between our panelists based on the questions from the floor. So that's, that's really it. Um, in terms of our speakers, I'd just like to introduce uh, the five of them, um, and then I will reintroduce each person as they come up. So we're delighted to have um, Sven Biskoff, uh, professor at Ghent University, who lectures on strategy and foreign policies of Belgium and the European Union. Sven's going to speak about the work of such a commission and how maybe it's not a good thing to strive for consensus. Um, he's going to speak about the nature of future military operations and possibly are they going to be more robust? And also to discuss the need to take into account the EU dimension of military integration. Our second speaker tonight will be Dr. Edward Burke, Director of the Centre for Conflict, Security and Terrorism and Assistant Professor in International Relations at the University of Nottingham. Edward will be looking at the Commission through the lens of Brexit, the UK perspective and considering some specific air implications. Uh, professor Ben Tonra, who I think this group knows very well, will, is Professor of International Relations at UCD School of Politics and International Relations and Ben has been a very uh, a vocal voice on defence matters for the last 10 years, uh, at least. And it really brought a lot of defence matters into a more mature uh, discussion. Ben will be looking at that, will be considering the fact that there's two main types of defence review generally, and that this commission could be actually different to both of those. He'll also lay out his hopes for the commission and also talk about some of his fears for the commission. Our fourth speaker is Dr. Brendan Flynn, a lecturer at the School of Political Science and Sociology in NUI Galway. Uh, Brendan's current research interests include maritime security and defence and security studies more broadly. Uh, Brendan will be looking at topical matters such as UN Security Council, uh, COVID-19, as well as looking at the purpose of the defence forces in a modern world with some particular attention to naval matters. And our final speaker, Dr. Katrina Heinel, who is Executive Director of the Azure Forum for Contemporary Security Strategy in Ireland, and also Adjunct Research Fellow at the University College Dublin. Uh, Katrina will be looking at, does the new reality of non-traditional 21st century risks mean that the proposed Defence Commission should examine whether the Defence Forces will be optimally engaged to achieve a better national outcome that aligns with foreign policy and defence objectives? So there are the introductions. Uh, Without further ado, I'd love to call upon uh, Sven Biskoff to start us off with tonight's discussion. Sven. All right, thank you, and uh, greetings from Brussels all. Uh, it is already eight here, of course, so in preparing for this uh, event, uh, my main decision to make was to have a rather early dinner before, or to have a really late dinner, but since I'm usually a hungry man, uh, I've had my dinner already, and I'm now sipping my cup of tea, even though it's quite warm, and I would feel like something more uh, uh, alcoholic maybe, but that can come afterwards. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me in. Um, I have some really limited experience myself with this type of 
exercise, and I, I'll build on that to make my first of three uh, points. Uh, um, my, my first experience was when NATO uh, created a commission headed by Madeleine Albright uh, to prepare the previous, the 2010 strategic concept. Um, and that was a commission international that sought for consensus and produced a very nice report, which was received by the Secretary General, who then locked it away in a drawer and never looked at it again. My main memory of the process is that I, I, I got five minutes to brief the, this commission. Um, basic saying EU first, NATO second, uh, and made Madeleine Albright chuckle. Kind of difficult to list on your CV, but I, I liked it, so I, 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 I mentioned it. Um, then in 2016, uh, Belgium prepared a defense paper um, and, and created a wise person committee, uh, which was the first time Belgium had ever did that. Uh, but, but it was a peculiar exercise in the sense that the committee never actually met. Um, so the defense minister basically asked a number of individuals, both academics and active and retired practitioners, and people from business also, uh, to write a paper. And those papers were then bundled and, and published um, without, further, without further ado, uh, actually. Um, but at least it was the first time that, that they did this, and I found it interesting. Um, so it just made me think, and a lot depends on the precise mandate of, of the, the commission that we will have in Ireland, but um, if, if the point is that the commission should advise the government and afterwards the government will write the actual defense paper or white paper, then my feeling is you should not necessarily strive for consensus within the commission, uh, because that makes it very easy afterwards for the government to ignore the paper if they want to. Of course, if, if sort of there, uh, there is a natural consensus, fine. But otherwise, I think there's more interest in, in having sharp alternatives uh, or alternative scenarios that can really inform the debate rather than a report that is already bland because you already strive for a consensus in this stage uh, where perhaps it's not necessary. So that was my, my, my first uh, quick point. Um, a second point having to do with, with the nature of the, of the operations. Um, uh, of course, Ireland is, is, is famous and well reputed for its contribution to, to peacekeeping. Uh, it's a sizable force also, always, relative to the size of the, of the forces. Um, my question is, though, for Europeans, you know, what will be the future types of operations? Um, expeditionary operations. And if I look then at Europe's own periphery in the south, um, I notice, one, that we will have to do a lot more ourselves because um, the, the US is pulling out of the operations in Northern Africa and the Middle East. Um, and, and even if, if the Democrats would win the presidential elections, I don't think that trend will be reversed, uh, which means that we Europeans will have to deal ourselves with security crisis there. Now, I do think that the current, what you know, Little Hart would call indirect approach can be maintained, uh, which is to say we try to address security problems in our southern periphery, um, basically through capacity building of, of local security uh, and defense forces, providing the military backbone to go into operations ourselves only if there's no other way to, to create a sufficient degree of, of stability, um, which is, for example, what France is doing, continues to do in Mali, right? Um, therefore, I do think, though, that we need to prepare for Mali-type cases in which we will be on our own, meaning the Europeans will be by themselves to take care of an issue like Mali. I think we are capable of that if we want to. But it does mean that you need a force that can take part in, in this sort of yeah, peacekeeping or robust peacekeeping, uh, or at times which is very close to peace enforcement. This brings me to my, my third and, and final point. Um, in order to have a national force that is employable in many scenarios, that, that has become very difficult, right? Um, I, I opened the military balance to look at, at uh, Irish forces compared with the Belgian forces. And in a way, they are similar. Uh, Ireland's two brigades, we, we combined our forces into, into one brigade of similar size, uh, actually. The fact is, we both have infantry. Uh, uh, 
but, but neither of us have all the uh, combat support and combat service support units that such a brigade would need if you want to be able to use it in every possible scenario, right? The Irish, an Irish brigade or a Belgian brigade by itself could not now be deployed in Mali and take care of itself because it lacks all kinds of, uh, of types of units. Huh? For example, in our, our case, very little air defense or, or artillery support. So we have good forces, uh, but there are not so many scenarios in which we can use them. Of course, we don't do so often uh, national operations, we usually deploy as part of a multinational force. But still, I think in order to make sure that, that our forces are employable in many more scenarios, I think it would make sense to anchor them in permanent multinational units. So I would urge in an exercise like this, not only to look at the national Irish context, but to look at the multinational EU context. Um, my idea is that a brigade is the, the smallest national building block of, of such military integration um, because it's the smallest um, independent independent force but if you can anchor if you anchor a national brigade in on a permanent basis into a multinational divisional core then you can arrange at divisional core level to have all the different combat support and combat service support units that you will need and suddenly your brigade which by itself is incomplete so to say could be uh, employable in all scenarios. And so the, the combat support and combat service support units, it could be division of labor, one nation does one thing, another does another, or you could merge some of the, uh, some of the capabilities. Uh, things like this are happening. Think of the Derm uh, German Netherlands Corps. Uh, a new uh, development is, is army to army cooperation between France and, and Belgium, the so-called CAMO project for Capacité Motorisée. Uh, motorized uh, or mechanized uh, capacity um, and this I think as, as I see it uh, is the future uh, future of forces so I would really um, this is probably uh, to, to, to conclude on that my if I want to, to pass on one message it, it's this uh, look at the European dimension because um, in my view the future of our national forces will be European if you want them to survive thank you Thanks, Ben. Great insight. And I, I can already, I can't hear, but I'm sure there's a lot of questions going to come from that already. That term, the EU Army, it's a, it's a very provocative one here in Ireland. And uh, I'm sure there's going to be lots of great questions on it. Um, our next speaker, Dr. Edward Burke, um, I'd call on him now to speak about the Commission through the lens of Brexit, the UK perspective, and speak to the media. Ed. Yeah, thanks very much, Pat. Um, and thanks for it. It's great to be able to, to chat to such a, a knowledgeable group and looking forward to hearing the questions. Um, so the first, first thing I'd like to say is that essentially that you know, 21st century threats require a fusion defense doctrine such as we've never had before. Um, and I have, I suppose, one principal argument is that we need to fundamentally change as a country how we think about national defense. Um, possibly, you know, since certainly the 1960s, 70s, we've, the Defence Forces have been organised to meet three constant demands. The first was, of course, mitigating the threat to our island security from, subver so from subversives. The second was um, what I would call more traditional aid to the civil power duties, such as stopping the spread of infectious disease, flood defence, counter-narcotics, anti-trafficking. And the third, of course, um, as Sven has already alluded to, was um, peace support operations, whether with the United Nations, the European Union, or our NATO uh, PFP. And so if the public sees the Defence Forces, it is invariably really in one of these roles. Um, and the above three, three tasks will, I would say, remain constant and demanding tasks that the Defence Forces will um, have to you know, keep meeting in the future um, because they, are, they fulfill important uh, national security and uh, strategic interests for, for Ireland. Um, I would say the first two will require more political attention and resources due to the effect of climate change and an a likely increase in global pandemics, such as we're living through right now. Um, and I'd say only relatively recently really has the, probably the last decade, 15 years, has the Defence Forces moved um, to counter the hybrid threats that will define much of international and intrastate conflict over the next two, uh, over the next decades. Um, so firstly, what I want to do is just quickly sort of talk about what these threats are, these hybrid threats, why we need a, a fusion doctrine. Um, and secondly, I'll, I'll, I'd like to also go on to ask what role the Defence Forces currently has um, and should have in meeting those threats. And finally, I just want to ask about 
and what kind of resources would be required uh, to do so. Um, so I'm, I, I like cows of it. So uh, a terrible kind of side effect is, is Trinitarian. You know, you have to bunch everything into threes. Uh, so I've done that twice already today. <laughs> uh, so the first thing, first in terms of threats, not to national security, of course, the greatest threat, I believe, is, is cyber and space. Um, and of course, you know, if you look at here in the UK, GCHQ have come out several times the last few years and said, look, the Category 1 attack on the UK is going to happen in the next five years. Um, the last time they said that was six months ago. Um, of course, the risk of contagion to Ireland is clear and obvious. We, we suffered um, contagion from ESB, NTMA. We've seen what happens when Russian or Chinese state intelligence services target the UK. We are very vulnerable because of our interconnectedness with, with them. Um, it's, it's very hard on Ireland, uh, as in the ESB case, to kind of uh, to, to, to separate out the two jurisdictions. Um, that, in terms of a Category 1 attack in critical national infrastructure, such as you know, what we saw in, in England in terms of shutting down parts of the NHS, um, is, is, is a real grave risk and is, is quite likely uh, to, to occur um, in the next uh, few years, certainly the next decade. Um, in terms of uh, why Ireland is possibly more of risk in the UK, was well, Ireland has less top cover in terms of we don't have the Signals Intelligence Service, so um, I would argue that perhaps we're not as joined up as well. Um, we don't have a um, CIS and the Defence Forces is relatively uh, poorly resourced. Um, the National Cyber Security Centre is not, is not a Signals Intelligence Service. Um, where will the threat come from? Well, a lot of the more dangerous activity presently, and it's, it's going up certainly on the Chinese side, is from, of course, Russian and Chinese state intelligence uh, services who are trying to sort of um, maneuver between, uh, maneuver uh, in terms of uh, trying to steal intellectual property, particularly from Five Eyes countries, but also from Ireland. Um, and we are obviously situated between three of the Five Eyes, and so we're quite, uh, you know, in terms of contagion, it's obvious um, where our risk. Um, and then, of course, uh, the lack of top cover is one thing, but of course we're, we could easily see a sharp escalation in international conflict, whether that comes in uh, in Taiwan, or that comes in South Asia, or that comes in Eastern Europe in terms of Ukraine. Um, you know, the, the, clearly we're living through an era of a more pronounced risk of, of interstate uh, hybrid or proxy, or, proxy or um, certainly an escalation in the type of hybrid conflict that we've seen to date, um, with the appetite then from, from Russia and others for more uh, risk in terms of uh, cyber espionage or cyber attacks. Um, it, in terms of in terms of um, other potential risks on the cyber and space domain, well, well clearly we have to think about um, AI. AI artificial intelligence will be a huge uh, game changer for defence in the next few decades. It's also a major risk. Um, lots of opportunities for defence forces, but does it also lead to greater dependency on other states in terms of technology? For a, a very significant risk that we have to think about. Um, we already are quite dependent in terms of manufacturing of our of key of critical defence assets anyway. Um, in terms of space, well, the EU is rightly uh, very concerned about European vulnerability um, as competition heats up, particularly between the US, Russia and China. Um, and this is an area where you know, certainly the uh, Ireland and the Defence Forces could play a real role. Um, and indeed UCD with you know, minimal input really in terms of resources from the government is already playing, playing a, an interesting role. Um, so um, I would say in summary, you know, in terms of looking at, obviously there's some good things happening on the NATO level, probably we need to engage as well with the new Cyberspace Operations Centre in months. Uh, don't see a political appetite for doing that in a sustained way yet, but we probably need to get on board with that. We need to um, reinforce CIS to do that in the Defence Forces. Um, we need to set up a National Security Strategic Investment Fund, in my view, to try and sort of, you know, tap into EU, uh, European Defence Funds, but also be more competitive, um, develop our own, our own industry. Um, and, but I would also say that in terms of just, you know, sheer cooperation between you know, Garda Cyber, CIS, uh, the National Cyber Security Centre, it's still not clear to me in terms of a Category 1 incident exactly who will do what when, um, in terms of response, in terms of jurisdiction. Um, so obviously I know that the Department of Teachers are looking at that, but it's still, still a gap that I think any defence review would have to look at. In terms of a, a sort of second level of threat, um, you know, five minutes roughly. So I'll try and, try and rattle out. If you, if, uh, in, in terms of terrorism, well, th the threat to Ireland is real. We saw Sweden, Finland, attack other neutrals have, have all suffered from uh, serious terrorist attacks. And we have a moderate risk of, of terrorism, uh, from, from Islamist terrorism. And that's, that's very much there. It's not going to go away. The Defence Forces um, you know, have a role to play in that, particularly in terms of not only in terms of a special forces capability, um, but also in terms of um, intelligence exchange. Um, um, certainly, uh, the right-wing terrorism in Ireland is becoming increasingly a factor, as some of you may have seen on Tuesday, in terms of the uh, Europol TSAT report, um, highlighting that a, quite a number of uh, right-wing uh, right extremist organisations were basing themselves and operating out of Ireland. 
which is concerning. Um, so uh, all, all, all of these things in terms of sort of a rise in, in potentially right-wing terrorism, um, a constant, uh, if, if perhaps not escalating threat uh, from Islamist terrorism, um, the Brexit effect on dissident republicanism, we're seeing dissident republicans move towards an anti-globalization, uh, rather extreme radical view, so uh, trying to sort of change tactics, which um, could cause a strain in terms of um, in, in just monitoring this. Um, so, and also the Brexit effect upon the border. And so what we're looking at is, is probably a, an uptick in, in, in the types of threats that basically the, AJ, the, the guards and the defence forces will have to monitor and deal with. That means, I would say, more capacity is probably needed in the future and probably more joined up thinking as well. Very briefly, in terms of a CBRN attack, um, the defence forces are really doing good work on this uh, recently, of course. And what we saw in Salisbury is a country like Russia is willing to murder European citizens, in, indeed in NATO's second most powerful state, in a, in a rather reckless uh, WND attack. Um, would, would they be willing to do so in Ireland? Well, Ireland is increasingly becoming a, sort of a, an area of, of a more pronounced intelligence activity, um, and, and you know there certainly is a risk there that uh, that a, a Russia under threat, a Russia that's feeling um, uh, an unstable and weakening Russia, which is what's happening economically to Russia right now and politically. I'd argue um, it's not like its intelligence service are, are sort of um, you know uh, are, are well constrained or are even well governed. And there's certainly a risk that, that something could happen in, a, in, a, in the international uh, global hub like Dublin. Um, what about un unexpected events? Well, I think uh, are the risk from long-standing violations of Irish coastal waters and airspace. As a man who grew up in Galley Head, I can tell you that Irish coastal waters have been violated many times over our state's history. Um, but in terms, of, uh, in terms of more recent events, of course, um, what we're seeing is that Russia again is sort of probing to see what the UK and NATO can do and what Ireland can do in terms of our, our maritime and uh, our maritime security, but also our airspace. Um, I won't, uh, Brendan's gonna go into the maritime, uh, some naval issues, so I won't, I won't dwell upon that. Um, but obviously there's two, two principal reasons for, for doing this. One is to tie down the RAF and Royal Navy resources, keep them sort of locked into, you know, into domestic, sort of keep them looking to the West Atlantic seaboard as opposed to even the North Sea. And then second of all, um, you know, threaten cr uh, critical national infrastructure, such as um, underwater cables in terms of serious escalation and tensions elsewhere. I'd say in terms of um, in terms of air power, well, you know, certainly the replacement of the Cessna fleet is a good thing. Um, some ice star capability is very welcome. Um, it's a very modest step for a very under resourced and under resourced service, um, and it certainly doesn't go far enough to, to mitigating uh, the serious threats um, that we've seen in recent years in terms of violations of of Irish controlled airspace, um, but also in terms of you know, activity in the Irish Sea as well on the naval side, which is which is also concerning, particularly for the Royal Navy here, um, but should also be of concern for for Ireland. I would say that when it comes to the larger question here is that whether the state wants to and should share capabilities and responsibilities when it comes to cyber, air and sea. Um, of course, the UK is Ireland's uh, natural geographic ally when it comes to air and sea power. And to what extent is Ireland willing to engage in some jointery with its largest neighbour when it comes to deterring a recognised Russian threat to Irish controlled airspace and its waters? I would say a partnership. If you want to do a partnership, well, the first thing you need to do is make a significant investment in naval and air power capabilities. Otherwise, I would suggest that the relationship will just simply be one of near dependency. I certainly don't want that as an Irish citizen. And so it's not an exceptional option in my view. Um, but of course, it, neither is the status quo an exceptional option because it will tempt our neighbours and allies, not least the US and the UK, to take an uninvited uh, initiative in our sovereign space in order to meet growing Russian, Chinese and other threats to, 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 uh, to their interests. Finally, just to sum up and say that, you know, in the words of... Um, the first, um, I'm not sort of being all Fine Gael about this, but uh, the first Minister of Defence, Richard Mulcahy, said that our army has been the people, is the people, and will be the people. And I think us as a defence community, um, officers, policymakers, academics, interested citizens, I think we need to communicate the concept of national defence in the hybrid, in this hybrid century, um, because as Mulcahy, a former insurgent, instinctively knew any sound security policy, of course, uh, must be understood and welcomed by the Irish people. So it can't simply be about looking at sort of um, flood defences, camp looking at, you know, aids and civil power in a more traditional role. Uh, they need to understand the threat, they need to understand what CIS and others do, what their CBA, CBRN capability is. Um, and, and we need to be, get much better at, at explaining the uh, why uh, national defence is the first role and obligation and priority of the defence forces and why they need to do that and why they need more resources to, to carry out that key, fu that key function. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Great. Uh, again, I think it's an area that's going to spark a lot of questions. Uh, we're going to just stick out our first poll of the evening. So you'll see it coming up on your screens. Please engage. And uh, again, we'll announce the... So the first 
poll of the evening is should the terms of reference include the role and performance of the Department of Defence? And I think what this I've just answered. Uh, so I think one of the places that we're coming from with that poll is you might have seen the initial terms of reference spoke about a commission on the defense forces. And I think a lot of people, certainly in the community, would feel that it's it's broader than just the defense forces. There has been dozens, well, maybe not dozens, but certainly a lot of reviews of the defense forces over the last 50 or 60 years. I'm not sure if there's been any on the uh, civil side. So it's probably something that, that we might, might need to think about. So our next speaker of the evening, uh, Professor Ben Tonra needs no real introduction. Uh, ben, over to you. Um, first of all, obviously, congratulations to IDFOC for, for pulling this together at such short notice, and I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted to be here with some, some spectacular colleagues to have this conversation with you all. Um, at about 36 uh, hours notice, uh, Pat asked me to take a look at what other, what other kind of examples of, of this kind of uh, defense poll, uh, defense commission exist out there and, and where the Irish example might fit into that. Um, and if you take a quick quick review, there's sort of three main models that we've seen out there. One is sort of a systematic and statutory defense review, which is provided for in legislation, which often happens at regular intervals, and is very is very much governed and run by, by the government executive. Um, the second is sort of a, a parliamentary defense commission, which we see quite a bit of in the Nordic countries, uh, where they're pulling together different political parties on, on the basis of the parliament, very often with an independent chair, and their ambition is usually to set mid to long-term defense strategy goals. Uh, and then third one is the one that, uh, that uh, Sven mentioned, which is the, um, the, the Committee of Wise Persons, uh, Committee des Sages, very much, very often unstructured, uh, very often sort of more blue sky thinking than sort of the practical nuts and bolts of, of where we go with our, with our defense. Um, and clearly what we're looking at in terms of the proposed commission on the defense forces is, is neither of those three. Um, and what clearly seems to have been in the minds of, of those who are, who are setting up was in fact the, uh, the Commission on the Future of Policing in Ireland, uh, which was led by Kathleen O'Toole a few years back, which was taking a really in-depth look at uh, Angarda Siakana, our, our police forces, um, and asking some pretty fundamental questions about those police forces um, in terms of, of very deep-seated problematic governance issues, um, in terms of developing public accountability, talking about the, the legitimacy of the police forces, talking about their culture and ethos, um, and then thirdly, looking at the function of, of, of Angarda Shiakon and how they exercise uh, those functions over time. Um, now, there are parallels here in terms of what we're looking at with the Defense Forces, but some very, very important differences that I think need to be, need to be borne in mind. Uh, the first of those differences is it's not, it's not an issue so much about, well, it will be, but it's not so much about what the Defense Forces do as to why the hell the Defense Forces are there and what they do. Um, so, you know, nobody was questioning of why do we have police forces? Um, in this case, we need to have the conversation as to what the defense forces are there for. We are aware of that, but as I think um, um, most people in, in our audience will understand, we don't have this national conversation about defense, about defense strategy, about the means of, of matching threat assessments with capabilities. Um, so we're, we're starting at a different level uh, in terms of this conversation on the defense force as opposed to the conversation that was had about Angarda Shiakona. Um, the other thing is that we have a very tight timeline here. I mean, the, the, the setup for this is supposed to be the terms of, rest, terms of reference is completed by the end of the year, and this thing only running for 12 months. So there's not a lot of scope for these people to go off and, and design something brand new. So my, my suspicion is that they're gonna take the template they applied to Angarda Shiakona, and they're going to apply it to the, to, to the defense forces. Um, it, it's what we call in political science path dependency. We've got a model, the model worked, let's just get, run the model out and apply it and apply it again. And in that respect, I have some hopes and I have some fears, and this is what I wanted to, to, to focus uh, my, my remarks on. One of my hopes is that this really is an independent review. I do not want to see this as some kind of conversation between stakeholders. I do not want to see the Department of Defense represented, the officers represented, the enlisted personnel represented. I, this should not be a stakeholder, stakeholder conversation because precisely as Sven said earlier on, what you will then get is some kind of an anodyne consensus driven document. What you need is a commission that is genuinely independent, having a very frank conversation about the defense forces, their role, purpose and function, uh, and what we need to do to give them the wherewithal in order that they successfully uh, complete their mission. Um, my second hope is, is for consultation. Um, and this isn't just consultation with the stakeholders. So obviously there has to be, as there was 
with the Garda Commission, that there has to be detailed conversation with officers, with enlisted personnel, with all of the stakeholders and all the political interests and all of the other interests uh, involved therein. Uh, but I really want to see consultation outside. I really want to see some consultation with, with like-minded countries overseas, whether that's New Zealand, Finland, Sweden, Belgium, comparably sized military forces, to have a conversation about what we need to be doing and what we need to be thinking about in terms of our defense uh, going forward. Um, my third hope um, is that we start from first principles, and that is again to say to have a conversation about what is the threat assessment, what are our defense forces there designed to do, and how do we give them the capacity and capabilities to undertake that? Um, because that, to my mind, that starting with first principles has got to be the starting point for this, for this commission. There was some of that with the Garda Commission, uh, because they did talk about new models of policing, new means of policing. So there, there was that early conversation, but it was much more about function towards the end. I think we need to reverse that and have a bigger conversation about defense strategy, purpose, and function before we talk about what the defense forces do, how they're structured, how they're governed, and how they work. Um, and so that starting with from first principles, I think, is really important. Um, and my final hope, and this is perhaps the more controversial one, is, is we really do need to talk about governance. Uh, and here I do think we will get into the Department of Defense. And I know a lot of people in this group will have a bee in their bonnet about the department. I've seen a lot of snarky conversations on social media in particular about former and current members of the Defense Forces throwing, throwing bricks at the Department of Defense and the Department of Defense in their own inimitable way throwing bricks back. You people have got to get your act together. If you go into this with a view of, you know, we're going to get one over the department or we're going to sort out the defense forces and, and, and get them tame, you know, this is going to be a disaster. If you go into this thinking our shared objective is an effective defense, then I think we have some hope and opportunity here. But the governance issues do need to be tackled. And frankly, and again, I speak as an outsider, the relationship between the department and the defense forces, to my mind, is currently poisonous. That has got to be addressed. There's a lot of game playing, there's a lot of advantage taking, but there's not a lot of thought about how we work with our partners to a shared goal and shared objective. And I think that has to be a really important part of this. And I think it will be tackled, even if this is called a commission on the defense forces, you can't have that conversation about the defense forces without talking about governance and without talking about the department, its, its attributes, its weaknesses, and its deficits. Um, my final point is, is, a, is, is just very quickly on fears. My abject fear is that this Commission on the Defense Forces becomes about HR, becomes about paying payments, becomes about salaries, becomes about retention, becomes about training. That's putting the cart before the horse. Let's talk about why we have Defense Forces, what we want the Defense Forces to do, and then let's talk about how we pay, retain, and incentivize appropriately the personnel we need to fulfill those functions. So that's, that's my fear, that this thing becomes all about the HR. My second fear is this becomes a forum for headbangers. And again, I refer back to, to, to my concerns about social media and the conversation we've seen thus far in terms of what the department should or shouldn't do, what the defense forces should and shouldn't do. It really is a case of two bald men fighting over a comb here. The conversation between the defense forces and the department. And we've got to get through that and we've got to get over that. Um, and my final, my final point, and this relates directly to Sven's conversation, is that this cannot be introspective. This cannot be just about Defence Forces Ireland. This has got to be about Defence Forces Ireland in a European context. It has got to be how we shape and form our Defence Forces to serve the national interests of this state, a state which is, which is an embedded and committed member of the European Union. And there is a shed load happening on the European front that Sven can talk about, that we have got to get our act together for and, become, and be able to pursue our national interests. And that for me, in terms, of, in terms of fears, is the biggest one. That we only talk about ourselves and we don't talk about ourselves in the larger European context where the real things are happening over the next couple of years. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ben. Certainly not letting us down in keeping things, keeping topics very topical, and I can see the questions flying in already. So thanks for that, Ben. Uh, next speaker, Dr. Brendan Flynn from NUI Galway. Brendan, over to you. Uh, greetings from the Wild West. Um, uh, I wanted to talk about jointness. I want to talk about peacekeeping, and I want to talk a little bit about maritime. But I want to talk about where we are right now 
and um, there's positive and negative in that, but most of it is actually very negative. If we were holding a conversation about an impending defence commission 18 months ago, I'd be more optimistic because the public finances are in a different space. The one chink of light is Ireland being uh, promoted and elected onto the um, UN Security Council. But of course, with that is going to come a lot of pressure and a lot of responsibility. I think it's a little bit ironic, and I'm going to be, I'm not going to be cynical, but I'm just fearful that wouldn't it be very, very bitter if the Defence Forces, which actually played a huge part through its peacekeeping record in getting that successful vote, if the Defence Forces then turned around and basically neglected and told you can have a commission, you can have a, a form, which as Ben sketched out, could go in ways that are not positive. It would be sad if, if the Defence Forces don't get money, doesn't get investment, doesn't get political support, um, because that's not just unfair. There's lots of unfair things in politics, but that's also stepping back from the investment in peacekeeping, which yielded the result it did in New York a few days ago. So I think the political elite, the civil service elite, need to, need to pay attention to the defence forces. I very much take what Ben said about that dysfunctional relationship needs to be addressed by both parties. Um, so we, we are where we are. Don't underestimate that the COVID-19 has created huge fiscal challenges. And the bottom line is the, the level of spend and the profile of Irish defence spending is such that, as Ben said, you're, you're fighting over a comb. You know, it's, it's very difficult to see how new capabilities can be engendered. But that's to mistake what a defence commission should do. It's not a shopping expedition drawing up a shopping list of bits of kit that would be nice to have and we might or might not be able to afford. It really needs to be a much more fundamental exercise, not just in thinking, but in communicating. And I, I think the Defence Forces hasn't always been great at communicating to above, to the civil service, what they really need among themselves about what the priorities are, what shouldn't be asked for and why. And then down and out to um, the public, the Irish public above all, and uh, to a wider community across Europe, as, as Sven pointed out. So uh, and in all of that, I think the COVID-19 situation, there's a real risk. That's what's going to lock in is, 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 a, is a view that will be sort of Oshie, or perhaps it won't be so sort of Oshie that forget about it. We're not going to spend a brass farthing on defence for the next 10 years. And that would be absolutely corrosive. So the big job of work, the first fundamental job of work of any commission has to be to tackle that lazy view, which I think is unacceptable, right? You don't walk away from your house in the middle of COVID-19, leave the doors open, not bother with the locks, don't pay the home insurance and don't fix the alarm. Defence policy is fundamental. It's not the most urgent thing right now, but there's a very important job that the, any defence commission has to do to articulate how you're going to basically keep defence um, with the limited money and with the constraints we have, how you're going to keep defence vibrant, relevant and reformed. So that's, that's a big piece of work and it's going to be massively challenging with the COVID-19 problems hanging over us. It also speaks to an immediate, I mean, if, if this is an independent review group, which is supposed to rethink defense policy, what it actually represents is halfway through the 2015 white paper, because the 2015 white paper is supposed to run up until 2025. It represents effectively um, a moment where you're sitting down saying, well, do we continue with the 2015 white paper? Many of you will know that there was a 2019 document produced by the Department of Defense just before Christmas, which basically produced a table which outlined the progress. And the progress is not that impressive. Um, I, I'm not going to go through the numbers. I, I inflicted on Pat a big, long spiel where I, I, I analyzed for him and, and for myself, for my own purposes, where we are. But a, a great deal of work has to be done on the white paper. And I don't mean the big ticket projects on, on buying new aircraft for the Air Corps or other things. Those things have just been signed off just very recently. But I, but I mean the whole gist of the whole thing and the, the whole direction of the whole thing. My basic take would be I would be very fearful of a whole mood or a whole attitude, which would be get rid of the white paper, just walk away from that and start with a clean sheet of paper. The clean sheet of paper might be a tiny little post-it note. You might end up with the fiscal space that is no more equivalent to that. I, I, would, I would urge that whatever the Defence Commission do, they don't trash talk. And, and wipe out a clean slate of the, of the work that's been done with the 2015 white paper. I and other people here could find things we don't like in the 2015 white paper, flaws, problems, conceptual slippages, and all sorts of things. But for, you know, the best is the enemy of the good here, okay? So I, I think it's good enough 
so you'd want to stick with it. And if you want me to be a little bit more concrete and detailed, I could go into detail on that. But the one thing I'd pick out, because I said I'd talk about maritime, is there's a, a project listed, the multi-role vessel. It's an extraordinarily expensive piece of kit. And there will be simply a mood music among people in the civil service, and I don't mean the Department of Defense, who are much maligned. I'm talking about people in the finance, uh, Kildare Street perspective. There will be people in journalism. There will be people in political parties, perhaps in government, who will say, we simply cannot afford a big ship like that. And why do we need a big ship like that? So I think a defence commission would pour into all that. I think very quickly what you get out of, and I, I went into it in detail in the thing I said to Pat, um, you're going to end up with, with a less ambitious shipbuilding project, ship procurement project. You're not going to be getting a ship like the New Zealand Navy have where you can drive on piranhas and drive them off again. You're going to get something more modest. It'll be a patrol vessel with some logistics capability. What will it actually do? What, what Ben, I think, was pointing out is what I'm more fascinated about is why would you want this? What are you going to use that tool for to transform your peacekeeping, to transform, transform your profile overseas, to build on what you've done in Operation Sophia? How, how are you going to use that as a tool to draw in uh, elements of the army to cooperate with the air corps because i really think the air corps should be seen now it's very important that they become expeditionary in the peacekeeping context that's a big thing that the new aircraft should be used to do but that would also be something that could synergize with the ship with a multi-role vessel um so i strongly think you know the level of getting into detail and you can you can get too much into detail and too much into the weeds but i actually think the public would welcome uh, academics and experts and people from all sorts of walks of life getting into the detail about capabilities, about doctrine, about training, um, not from the point of view of, as Ben was saying, a human resources tidy up exercise, but what do we want to do in the world? What's realistic for us to do in the world? What's for a defense like ours with constraints we're in? I see people are asking questions about whether we could ditch the neutralist way, the way they frame in the draft program for government, the assumption is that it's irrelevant theology, or how do you actually make it something that, that's viable and realistic? So um, I'm not sure if, if that helps uh, the discussion. I, I'm some guy who'd love to go into a lot more detail, um, but I think that what's going to be really fascinating is the questions. And I'm just watching Pat there. You're giving me the sign of the cross to say I'm out of time. I'm not. Um, no, you're good, Brendan. Sorry, it was just the reception was gone there for a moment. So crack on, keep going. Yeah, the, the, I mentioned I'd talk about peacekeeping. And the only, the only thing that jumped out at me on peacekeeping is uh, I see very much the multi-role vessel as a tool for, for different sort of peacekeeping. I think we need to have a very robust discussion about peacekeeping, but not the one that sometimes people fear, which is that we shouldn't do peacekeeping or that I also hear from serving military people that we shouldn't just be defined by peacekeeping, they're correct. But peacekeeping is a very important thing, but maybe the offer that Ireland makes in peacekeeping has, has, has become stale and stayed. And maybe we need to watch that space that Canada ended up, you know, they didn't get elected. Now there's lots of reasons why they didn't get elected. Uh, and it's not because they wheeled out Celine Dion and we wheeled out Bono. I think there's more to the story uh, than that. Um, but, I, but I think the peacekeeping offer that Ireland's making will have to change. I mean, for one thing, special forces will become more important because Western armies going to places like Mali, and Sven started this discussion with Mali, the mission in Mali, not just the EU mission, but the Western presence in Mali is arguably failing. Mali, well, the West will lose Mali in the same way that we lost Afghanistan. And I've, I've just finished reading um, Theo Farrell's excellent book on on. Uh, the Afghanistan mess and insanity and the importance of, of political negotiation, the importance of political strategy, the importance of a military that could speak to the political and the political that can speak to the military and the importance of figuring out what on earth you're actually at. Are you war fighting or are you capacity building or are you peacekeeping? These are all debates we need to have, not for Afghanistan, but in the context of where we're at in Mali and in other operations that will emerge. I, I'm going to wait for the questions. I'm going to leave it to my colleagues. I could go on and on and on and on. But um, great opportunity, and I really look forward to your questions. Thanks. Sorry, fat finger syndrome here. I keep, keep trying <laughs> to mute myself. 
Uh, thanks for Mary, for that, Brendan. Again, I can see questions flying in, so looking forward to the Q&A after this. Uh, our final speaker of the night, Dr. Katrina Heinel, Executive Director at the new Azure Forum for Contemporary Security Strategy. Katrina, over to you. Sorry, Pat. Um, also a case of fat fingers. Can you hear me? Pat, can you hear me? Yes, hear you perfectly. Okay. Thanks. Okay, yeah. Great. So good evening, everyone. Um, I would also like to thank the Defence Officers Club for um, having me back this year. Um, I guess I, I, I hope I did something right on the last occasion that we met. Um, so the question, like Pat explained at the beginning, um, uh, the question I felt I would like to pose um, this evening um, for the purpose of our, of our discussion is, um, uh, does the new reality of non-traditional 21st century risks mean that the proposed uh, Defence Commission should examine whether the Defence Forces will be optimally um, engaged to achieve a better national outcome that aligns indeed with our Irish foreign policy and defence objectives. So um, in, in approaching this question, um, I have uh, laid out um, four or five um, um, uh, aspects or kind of key questions that I think we, we would uh, need to explore going forward. So first, um, I would propose that there, there could be possible value in the consultation process or uh, even the Commission itself examining whether we are making the best use of the Defence Forces in line with the needs of um, a modern 21st century military. Um, and if not, what can be changed? And here, um, I, I think there is, there is quite some similarity in, in some of the um, aspects I'm going to discuss um, and uh, what the, the other speakers have mentioned, but I think I'm going to come at this from a slightly different approach, so, so bear with me. Um, I want to draw a distinction between the number of traditional and non-traditional defence and security matters. So it goes without saying that globally and nationally, we are facing new challenges and the nature of conflict and warfare is changing. Um, the, the proposed uh, program uh, does uh, allude to new challenges, um, but again, in, in very broad terms, it doesn't go into any depth uh, from there. So before I um, kind of provide some examples of new ch challenges, a little bit along the lines of, of the conversation that, that Ed started, um, I would just like to take a little bit of a, of a step back um, and uh, try and provide some context with a view to identifying lessons um, for moving forward. Um, when we look at, um, and this sounds rather academic, but, but there's a reason I'm bringing this up, when we look at some of the literature and the historical context, at least predating um, 2012, 2010, uh, there, there is a legacy of states that have been dealing with um, new de demands placed on the, their security policy since the Cold War by transforming their military structures with effects on um, what's called the conceptualization of soldiering. Um, and, and here um, I'm um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but by 2012, democratic states were already um, uh, calling upon their armed forces more and more to, to fill these kind of un unconventional tasks. So no news to anyone here, partly civilian, humanitarian, and partly military. In what was then described, and here I think this is important terminology, the new security environment. So if we fast forward beyond 2012 and look at the past decade and our near-term future, what is our new security environment now? And uh, like, what, like what, what environment are we swimming in for this new commission here in Ireland? So um, I, I think in this regard, there are certainly pertinent questions that we must answer, um, not just here in Ireland, but also globally, about the types of good practices and best approaches um, uh, to deal with what we now describe as this um, next new security environment. And this includes these types of non-traditional security challenges that, that Ed touched upon. Um, uh, and I'm not going to, to the current example. First, when it comes to traditional or, co traditional or conventional warfare, it's clear that large scale interstate wars are continuing to be in decline. Second, um, certainly the Defence Force's role is to provide for the military defence of the state from armed aggression. Yet there is this growing scale of modern hybrid warfare activities um, and, and activities that fall below the threshold of armed conflict. So um, just to, to kind of call on some of Joseph Nye's writing, well, he has even gone so far as to suggest um, that within this hybrid sphere, as the 2019 um, white paper update describes it, that this distinction between civilian and military might even disappear. 
So I guess the question for us to consider is, does this have implications or should it have implications for how the defence forces might aid the civil power? And what are good practices in other countries on these um, really present day questions um, that can be adapted or suited to our own unique Irish context? By way of another example, um, which I did actually um, mention at last year's event, um, it's clear that major powers in some of the, um, the most advanced economies are still even today um, trying to figure out the best role of military in cyber conflict. Um, just to give you one, uh, one specific example from that field. So this is a work in progress elsewhere. Um, so again, questions that a commission or experts could, could start delving into in a bit more depth is, do these kind of new threats mean that the defence forces function um, should be slightly tweaked, like what should it look like? And I ask this question because these are questions and there are new approaches that are coming out of other countries um, uh, given the realities of this field. Other examples, um, and the list goes on, um, of just these new types of risks, and, and many of them are laid out in, in, in the 2015 White Paper, include climate change, globalisation, migration, resource scarcity, pandemics, and so on and so forth. Um, my only question here would be, while there's a, clearly a very thought through list of non-conventional threats that are laid out there, it's not so apparent within the um, national security policy response that section um, that are like, like how we're going to deal with each of these um, threats. It's not particularly clear to me that that's laid out for, for each of those. So the key question for this first um, kind of aspect of, of the theme I want to explore tonight is should military structures in Ireland be transformed to take into account these new conceptualizations of soldiering in a new security environment, or at least are a new security environment? Um, and if this mix of traditional and non-traditional security and defense is in fact the new norm, are we making the best use of the defense forces to preserve our national security and safeguard our economy? So secondly, like, I think this is a nice segue um, from some of the points that, that Ben um, raised what does, it, what does this all mean for civil military relations and, and the role of the defence forces? So it's clear there, there, are, there are indicators that these trends that Ed raised that I'm trying to bring out in, in tonight's conversation, it's clear that they are already impacting and shaping civil mill relations in other countries or will do so at some point. So how is this already manifesting in Ireland um, and what should we do about it going forward to make, the, to make sure that we make even better use of the military instrument and I would propose, and on this, I think I'm, I'm, I really am hopefully not naive about this, but I am positive that I think it's an opportune time for the Defence Commission to examine what pattern of civil mill relations will best ensure that military is successfully leveraged in this latest new security environment for the overall benefit of the country. And that leaves us with some very slightly uncomfortable conversations, but what's the... This, it leaves us with the need to examine interactions between the institutions of the state and the military. And here I do, I think there's some comfort to be drawn in placing current trends and dynamics, um, not just here in Ireland, but generally with these new trends in the context of lessons from recent history and to, to foster new solutions um, for us as we move forward. And I want to... I it's just want 20 to, hours. Uh, I just want to draw on um, a few examples here um, uh, before I conclude under this theme, um, political, strategic, social or technological circumstances have sometimes changed so significantly that existing civil mill bargains have become obsolete. Um, serious civil mill clashes have often come about because of a changed security environment in the past. So where vacuums arose because of a lack of agreement um, about what the military should do in, in new security environments. So I think this is important. These are important lessons that have been um, uh, learned elsewhere. And to give you some, some very brief examples of periods of these, this kind of vacuum or ten, where tensions have, have arisen, um, at the end of the Cold War, after 9-11, where there was a shift from uh, conventional warfare thinking and move towards irregular um, aspects such as counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, and um, more recently where militaries have become involved in disaster relief. So past consequences, and I really feel this speaks to some of the worries and fears that Ben laid out this evening, some of the consequences that have been seen in, in other jurisdictions of these vacuums have included military becoming alienated from civilian leadership, resistance to civilian oversight, 
officers' belief that they have the right to confront or resist policymakers and to insist that their, their recommendations be heeded, as well as leaks to the press. Um, so these are kind of, th these are lessons from the history, from history. And I guess where I want to bring that, I, I raise that because I feel given the potential vacuum that we might now find ourselves in at the moment with new security issues, like those that we have raised this evening, there might be real value in, in, in genuinely, like really spending time analyzing the best role for the defense forces and re-examining this pattern of civil military relations. And having a defense commission work towards possibly restoring an equilibrium along similar historical lines where dis disequilibrium might have arisen in other, in other examples in other jurisdictions and renegotiating these bargains. Um, and I say all this because otherwise I guess I, would, I wonder whether um, uh, that there is a possibility that we might see um, additional tensions and frustration. Um, and I also wonder, and again this is me hypothesizing, um, I wonder whether this kind of sense of frustration could, uh, or underlying frustration, could indeed impact retention issues as well. Um, I, I, and this is a kind of unrelated to pay, to pay matters, but just a general sense of frustration. So third, and I'm going to move swiftly through this in the interest of time, um, I'll just have two, two three more um, broad themes. Uh, in relation to, and here I think this seems to be a pattern throughout each of the presentations um, this evening, uh, in relation to civil mill relations and our interactions between the people of the state and the military, um, I think I would I, I would agree with most of the points that were uh, raised this evening in terms of um, suggesting that a review could in fact be conducted on citizens' understanding um, and their expectations in 2020 of the military's role, um, including what are the people's desires for the allocation of responsibilities. And here I'd go so far as suggesting, I think an evidence-based analysis um, would go a long way in this regard and in fact um, and I'm, again I'm preaching to the choir here the 2019 white paper update does does give an example of defense reviews in other countries that engage in these wide-ranging consultations they bring in the general public in kind of town hall style meetings and they interact very closely with defense experts and analysts and analysts um, fourth very qu quickly and this is something I've spoken about um, in, in other forums but, um, you know, again, we need to examine where um, this long list of new risks um, means a reform and change is needed and where it does not. So, again, there, there, there are trends and aspects and um, examples, um, not just here in Ireland, but in other countries of new risks like cyber, to be very specific, being hijacked to argue for very radical change, whereas a healthier approach would mean analyzing and retaining those established practices and structures that work well, um, and then being very open to adopting new practices where, where we need to for new challenges. So in other words, um, identify truly novel 21st century practices where traditional or 20th century solutions are redundant. And lastly, um, and Pat, I hope I've kept to time. Um, uh, a good, um, a last key point is I wonder whether there might be value in examining how we understand and leverage military power in Ireland. So again, often when we speak of military power, there's a tendency to think of hard power. Um, but again, you know, there are arguments out there that non-coercive use of military resources can be an important soft power for framing agendas and attracting support in world politics. And to that end, um, I think there's some really interesting examples out there, um, at least since 2015, uh, in relation to um, defence diplomacy and how this is being used favourably um, in, in, in a number of countries. So a question, and I'm going to leave you with this very last question, is whether the Commission could examine what type of defence diplomacy could be undertaken by the Defence Forces to support governmental partners and um, efforts to secure and promote Ireland's um, social, political, economic and cultural values. So um, I'm going to pass it over to you now. Pat. Thanks Katrina, great question to end it on. Um, just to say, we're going to have a second poll of the evening there. Um, so Moelise has got to launch it. There you go. Uh, should the Secretary General of the Department of Defence continue to be the county officer for the Defence Forces? Interestingly, um, I hadn't seen that poll. It's going to come up. It's the topic of quite a number of questions we're getting in tonight. Uh, you know, different versions of that. Uh, so we'll let you all get a chance to answer the poll, catch your breath, and then I'll, we have so many questions coming in, uh, some great questions, 
I'm trying to kind of package them together. So my apologies if I'm not asking you any of your specific questions, but I'm trying to address the topics in general. And I suppose the topics that I'm seeing coming in here are broadly around, you know, EU army, dare I say it, PFP, NATO. Um, ben, lots of questions around your, your fear around HR and leaving that out. Uh, Ed, lots of questions around why are people more interested in, why are some of the great powers more interested in what's happening in Ireland? You mentioned about uh, you know, more intelligence activity. You mentioned about air and maritime activity. Um, Brendan, there's questions to you about the impact of Brexit on maritime. Uh, so we might come back to that later on. And Katrina, questions for you there on like how do we address the civ mill relations and uh, also on cyber. So Sven, we might start with you, seeing as you've been sitting there quietly coming up with some great points, I'm sure. Um, so if I sum it up, Ireland is a neutral country. We have limited uh, participation in ESCO. We are part of Partnership for Peace. And the questions are, in your opinion, should we be more active? Should we look for enhanced cooperation with NATO, similar to Finland and Sweden? And should we be doing more in Europe? Yeah, thank you. Well, on NATO, let's say, I think it would make sense, of course, to me, if all EU member states were either clo partners, closer, close partners or members of NATO, but then also with the idea of acting more as EU within NATO. Because I, I would see the future of NATO more and more in a, what to say, in a broadly bilateral way. Meaning that the reality is that the players on the European side are not the individual states, not really. It's, it's the Europeans collectively. So my ideal view, but I know this, this is going to be very difficult to realize, but my ideal view is that, that we should act as EU also more and more uh, within the alliance. Now, within the EU itself, though, I think we really have to take uh, integration further because I see two, uh, well, I see three scenarios for, for um, the majority of, of the armed forces of Europe, except maybe those of the really, the few biggest member states. Um, either they will stay completely separate and they will whittle away because you know the, the, the pressure on the budgets is going to stay and, and in the end you will you will end up with a with a force that is at such a small range that it is employable and hardly any scenario. I mean Belgium still does a national day parade. We can always do that. I don't know if we do that in Ireland. Uh, and, and we can do that without any help, but, but, but that, that's about it. Or uh, you become an annex of a bigger country, uh, right? Um, Belgium uh, could uh, we already have merged our navy more or less with the Dutch. I argue we should do air force cooperation with the Dutch. Army is now cooperating with the French. But if that's not linked in to a broader EU scheme, the risk is that you end up sort of yeah as an as an appendage of a bigger country, or you frame those various bi trilateral cooperations in an in an EU framework, and we decide. Uh, as we said, actually, in PESCO, the point is to create a comprehensive uh, full-spectrum force package uh, that is permanently integrated. So that's not an EU army. For me, an EU army means soldiers on the payroll of the Union. No, those are soldiers on the payroll of a member state, but they are part of a package and they have a permanent fixed role in the package so that the lot together uh, is a full-spectrum force. Uh, and that gives member states a lot of flexibility to choose what kind of role they, they want to play. Those who want can focus more on territorial defense. Others can focus more on expeditionary, but there's something in it for some, for, for everybody. But my feeling is that now that a lot is, how to say, it gives the impression that a lot of ongoing, is ongoing in the EU with PESCO, the European Defense Fund and so on. But basically we are what we, we are, what you say in France, French, uh, sur place. It's sort of, you know, uh, water treading. It creates a lot of movement, but, but you're not, not advancing. We really need to use these tools and integrate our forces. So we don't just have to cooperate. We don't just have to be interoperable. We have to integrate. And otherwise, I think forces like yours and ours, in the end, not, not, not much will remain. 
Thanks, Ben. Uh, do, do any of our domestic contributors want to come in on that? Because like, whilst that might sound very objective and rational, I'm not sure how that will go down in a conversation in most pubs around Ireland. So anyone want to come in on that? Just say, I don't think we're going to have a conversation about neutrality. I think the terms of reference will make that very, very clear. The terms of reference are we're, we're working within what, what is now referred to as, as active military neutrality, um, which begs the question as to what passive military neutrality looks like, which is probably what we do at the moment. Um, so I, have, I, I don't think we're going to have that conversation. But I think the, the, the more important point that, that Sven is making is what contribution do we make in a European context that is A, effective in the pursuit of Irish national interests and be effective in making a reasonable and proportionate contribution to broader security issues on the behalf of the European Union of which we're a part. Thanks Ben. And I think, I mean, we're all talking about rational strategic decision making here, but in reality there is a political dimension to all of this and there's a human dimension to all of this. So, I mean Ben, to go back to the point, and I don't know was it a hope or a fear, but you made the point about you don't think that this should be dealing with HR retention and those kind of matters. And in fact, a lot of the a lot of the people contributing agree with it, with that, that it has to be first principles, it has to look at threats, purpose, and roles. However, a lot of people would also say we can't wait until the commission has has concluded to then start on defense. Uh, sorry, then start on HR. So how do we deal with that? Like what's a rational way to deal with that? Deal with both of those issues. Um, I don't think you're going to get them dealt with at the same time. Um, clearly what the program, for, I mean, if we get this government and we get this program for government, we have the commission and then we have the statutory body on pay. Um, within the commission, I think pay and retention is clearly part of the conversation. But after we've had the conversation as to what the defense forces are for and what they do. Um, and, and my genuine fear is this, this level of introspection that we sometimes get into, you know, where we start talking about, you know, the historical demand for the third brigade, we start talking about the condition of the toilets and the curra. I mean, the, the stuff becomes incredibly micro incredibly quickly. Um, and, and God help Sven. I mean, I don't think he has any idea of the political significance of your second poll question about the Department of Defense being the, the accounting officer. I mean, you know, the politics behind that and, and, the, and the micromanagement that lies behind that and the poisonous relationship that lies behind that question is, is very strikingly unique to the Defense Forces. And I really want us to break that box out. Uh, and think think big about what we want, what we do, and how we do that in the European context. And is there any reason there can't be concurrent processes in your opinion? I, I just think in, in terms of the way it's been set up in the program for government, you know, that's that's what they've set up. They've set up this 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 consecutive thing. We have the commission first, and then we have a statutory process at the end of it. I think perhaps the fact that we only have a 12-month window to get the commission up, running, and done and dusted. Um, gives you a very, very concrete deadline to the conversation, but I think it's going to be consecutive. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Ben. And everyone, all the other panelists, feel free to come in on these topics if you have a strong opinion on it. Um, Ed, sorry, Brendan, you want to... Yeah, my, my only observation was, uh, Ben is exactly right, they have already split the phasing so that the nitty-gritty details of pay and the mechanisms to set up a pay arrangement on pay and conditions arrangement is quite distinct from the commission. However, a commission could look at, for instance, the status of reserves. And one of the questions with reserves is pay and conditions and, and how, how you pay reserves, especially when they're stood up and they're mobilized, they're in uniform and they're deployed. And you could look at, for instance, um, issues about professional, highly technical trained cadres, about how other armies like the Belgian army or um, uh, the Finns, for instance, who have a largely conscript force, which straight away you would say no relevance to us, but they do have a professional cadre and they pay them and they have different conditions and different employment contracts. So you can actually perhaps work back in some general points about a professional military, the officer cadre, the NCO cadre and, and, and enlisted personnel and what's reasonable expectations for a career profile and the levels of remuneration related to the cost of living. That's an important point cost of living could be very different. So you can ask questions about how a Finnish officer would expect if they want to go professional and stay, what's their career trajectory? Would they expect to be um, you know, out after five years or would they be expect to be out after 22 years? And is that good military practice? What isn't or is not good military practice? So you can come at it a little bit in, in terms of general principles, but not in terms of nitty gritty. 
And Brendan, while I have you to go back to some of the questions that are being addressed to you, I suppose I'd sum them up as, um, do you think COVID has acted as a bit of a wake-up call? That in Ireland, our national take on things is quite often, it'll be grand. With COVID, we now see sometimes it's not grand and sometimes you need to prepare. So has COVID been a wake-up call, particularly in the context of Brexit and its impact on maritime and all defence and security matters? Well, they're kind of separate, but absolutely, I, I'm somebody who thinks it is. I, I think it brings back your core national institutions. You know, you need, you need a very good public health system. You need schools. You need the police force. And we've had a commission on that to reboot and fix our police force. Uh, and you need an army that, and an air corps and a navy, which is professional and fit for purpose. Those are the, that's the usual word that's used. But, you know, it's a cliche. But it, COVID reminds, reminds you that you need your basic national infrastructure to work. So we can talk about 5G, you can talk about roads down to Cork and, and Limerick and all the rest of it. But if, you're, if, you're, if your military and if your policing, and if your civil service has levels of dysfunction or problems, and I think we've already seen most people who are familiar knows that there is dysfunction, that there are problems. So those need to be addressed. Now, they can't be addressed right now or in the first six months of government, but they can be addressed over a long period of time. And that, that's something very important, that the, um, the urgent doesn't displace the important. And the important is to get the Defence Forces right. And we, we owe that to the Defence Forces. Uh, on Brexit and Marine, I'll be very short because other people want to come in. Um, there's lots of things, but the major problem with Brexit from a Marine Naval Service perspective, and I, 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 you know, I've talked to people from the opposite side as well, from a British perspective on this. Not many people know, by the way, just in the last few days, the, the Royal Navy and the Irish Navy were playing together on exercises. So they're trying to keep the relationship fairly uh, friendly and good. Perhaps that's a, a worry on both parts of both services that they're going to end up in some kind of cod war off rock all over mackerel allowances or something obscure. And believe me, there is every possibility for both of our wonderful uh, political um, jurisdictions to get into a stupid uh, fight over fish. Uh, off the um, the windy isles of, of Donegal. So, I mean, it, it is actually a serious problem. I think institutionally, one of the things I'm not happy about the Brexit thing, there's lots of things I'm not happy about Brexit, but uh, it brings the Navy back to, it'll, it'll pull the Navy back to fishery protection, fishery protection, fishery protection, fishery protection. The big lesson of the success of Operation Sophia is that don't turn your your units into one-trick ponies. They need to be allowed to do different things to grow and evolve. That applies to the Army, that applies to the Air Corps, that applies to the Naval Service. Don't, don't bracket and define a uniform service as, sure, you lads and ladies, you only do fishery protection, that's all you do. So there's a terrible, there's a terrible Groundhog Day to the whole Brexit thing on fisheries and on, on maritime. I can talk about other things, but I'll just hand back to you and, and others. Thanks, Brendan. Katrina, I'm going to throw two questions to you uh, that people are asking about. So. Uh, two things that you spoke about was civil mill relations, and then you also touched on technology. So, in terms of civil mill relations, like what what can we do, or what can the Commission do, or what can Ireland do to improve those relations? Um, thank you, Pat. So, I guess, um, uh, uh, and maybe to kind of um, clarify, I think the example or the kind of the angle I was coming from, at least, is that. Um, at least in the past elsewhere, um, it, with respect to kind of legacy or kind of historical context, when the security environment, environment changed so profoundly for different reasons, sometimes including technological um, developments, that there was um, the consequence was effectively this tension or a frustration that arose because there was no sense of consensus on what military, military um, should do. Um, and so with um, my main point here, um, uh, which, which I hope is clear for, for, for those who asked the question, is that with all these new risks, um, either those that are here already for the past decade, including cyber, which uh, is 10, 20 years, um, but with those coming down the line, so emerging, emerging risks too, and uh, this new reality, let's say, um, is there a risk that military um, is not actually functioning um, or being used um, to, to, to the best of its ability um, currently. Um, and, and I mean, you know, this is clearly relevant in the Irish context, but, it, but it's also a question um, being explored um, in, in, in other uh, jurisdictions. Um, and because of that, um, is there a risk that frustration could even become even more increased than it already might be? 
Um, so the suggestion I made um, in this regard is that we need to explore the civil mill pattern that, that is, uh, and come identify what is the best pattern for this new environment. Um, and, and this might mean that despite the current civil mill tensions that Ben alluded to, um, my concern, um, um, uh, uh, really when I looked at this tonight, or last night rather, and, and, and this morning, is that there is a risk that because of these new risks and this new reality, let's say, um, that tensions could become even more exacerbated than, than, than um, they already are. So I think a commission or experts exploring these questions, um, I could really add value in, in, in that regard. So I hope that helps answer that question, Pat. Yeah, great. And a second one that's coming up there for you as well, um, and across the board, is just on cyber specifically. Like, would you have any thoughts on what we can do to, to try to improve the defence forces or Ireland's defence capability in cyber? Or what's the best practices from around the world that we can look to? Um, I guess I have a two-pronged... Uh, two um, Two, two observations in that regard, Pat. Um, first, when it comes to defence capabilities, or um, and I spotted some of the language being used earlier, um, offensive cyber capabilities, um, I would point out, and again, th these are open-ended questions, there is analysis to be conducted or should be conducted, but I would point out that responses um, to malevolent cyber behaviour uh, don't necessarily have to be in kind. So cyber offensive capabilities are not necessary um, for responding to malevolent um, or, or state activity that um, uh, kind of crosses a, a threshold um, that we're not happy with. So, you know, the usual diplomatic responses can be used, but of course, other traditional, other offensive capabilities that are non-cyber um, uh, can potentially be used. Um, again, that's the type of language or the type of thinking that you would see in some national strategies, cyber strategies in other countries, such as the Netherlands, Australia, the UK, so on and so forth. So what I would consider proposing, where I think we could, and again, I, I'm not sure this is for the commission, but uh, um, I think cyber strategies and the transparency associated with publishing this type of thinking um, uh, on our uh, approach to offensive capabilities or cyber capabilities um, adds to a uh, level of transparency at least. Um, the second kind of prong or aspect to, to that question um, with respect to the, the kind of the, the military role um, um, and, and cyber um, writ large, I know we're, we're, I'm not, we're not using the right term, terminology when we say the cyber, but um, with cyber related matters that um, I, I guess my worry would be that it's, if it's an open-ended question in most of the advanced economies and most of those kind of major powers that um, are throwing a lot of uh, financial and uh, labour resources at these questions, if it's still an open-ended question in terms of the, the best or role of military and you know, how military should be engaged in this space, um, I'd be pretty surprised if it's a closed door here in that regard, or why is it a closed door in terms of analysis? Um, I guess my call there would be, um, this doesn't seem to be in line with the lie of the land elsewhere. So um, I'd like to kind of, you know, have that type of um, conversation. Again, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's for the commission, but, but to answer Thanks, your question. Katrina. Um, we're pretty much out of time, but I suppose there's one general question that's coming up from a number of people, which is, so we're talking about a commission and we're talking about maybe what should be discussed and shouldn't be discussed. The last question to sum it up is, what types of people or who should be on this commission? Um, should it be military, civil, should it be international? Uh, anyone have thoughts on that to kick us off? It, it, should, it, should, it, should, it should be internationally led. I think, I, think, I think we need somebody from outside to give us the perspective we need. Um, and, and I would, you know, notwithstanding my earlier criticism, I would take the model of the, of the um, review of the Garda Shikana. Um, if you look at the, their membership, I mean, like, again, I think you see that in, in the program for government. Those are the kinds of people they're thinking about. They talk about people in management, from academia, from law, um, and, and some international military perspective. So I, I, think, I think the template they're using is there. Um, again, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to see this become a representational dogfight. Great. 
And anyone have any opinions on the types of countries when we're looking at international participants? Like, who should we be looking to? Is it other neutral countries, other countries with similar size of resources like New Zealand or anything like that? Is it okay if I jump in, Pat? Please. Yeah, um, I think on that point, um, yeah, I saw within the proposed um, uh, program that um, uh, it specifically mentioned um, uh, primarily focusing on small states or those who are uh, states that are non-aligned. Um, I, I think there could, I think we might might possibly be too limiting if 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 the experts didn't go beyond um, that that kind of um, category um, of states. I think there are good practices. Um, elsewhere um, that, that could also um, uh, add value uh, to our thinking. Um, and I just, if you don't mind, just want to go back to your, your, your first question there in terms of um, who should be on the commission. Um, I guess one aspect that would kind of concern me, and I guess it, it's also sitting in on so many um, talks and seminars and conferences here over the last uh, year or two, um, is this kind of sense, uh, uh, kind of a, a refrain um, that if you don't have operational um, expertise that really you don't have any stake in the game you know you're, you're just an academic and so on and so forth I think that's a real I, I think there's a, a danger and a risk when it comes to uh, new threats and, and particularly we've seen this firsthand um, over the last 10 years in, in the field of cyber that you're, you're absolutely missing the boat it's not a reflection of the reality a reflection of the reality of this field if um, you're you're not working very, very closely with private sector um, and academics and civil society and, and, and the whole list of other stakeholders. So, so again, I, I would be worried that um, that might become a refrain for the commission. Oh, you know, you're an academic or you're from private sector. What do you know about defence? So that's just my, my tuppence worth there. Thanks, Katrina. Anyone else have comments on that before we wrap up? Maybe one, one word. I Please would say, um, think about alongside whom will you be deployed and, and ask uh, military from those countries. So that's probably not the other neutrals, that's somebody else I would say. That's a great point. Ed? Just very briefly as well, I think, I think as well we usually look to our, you know, the Nordics and Austria and you know we kind of look for the similar sized countries. I think it's important to, to think about what some of the larger countries think about us as well. Um, particular, you know, our nearest neighbour, um, you know, because as Brent was talking about with the Royal Navy, you know, we have these kind of inter-service very good relations, but unfortunately, sometimes at the brass level and at the senior official level, I think you know we need greater exchange actually, rather than, you know, we don't have that uh, frequency of kind of high-level dialogue and defence that that actually two neighbours probably do need, um, and so I think I think sort of it's an opportunity for you know I think yes, cooperation has been good in Mali and elsewhere and, and domestically as well in terms of the islands, but. You know, we should also think about you know what does uh, the UK, France, the US think about us? Uh, you know, particularly because we're we're sandwiched between them. Yeah. Well, on that rare note of positive multilateralism these days, uh, thanks to our panelists. I mean, that was superb. My only my only uh, problem with it is that we didn't get more contributions from all of you because it was outstanding. Um, just a couple of things to say. I think it's worth trying to follow on this conversation on Twitter. I think most of the contributors are on Twitter. So I would, perhaps if people want to keep the conversation going or, or have some more interaction with each other, maybe think about a hashtag Commission on Defence, not the most imaginative hashtag and a little bit difficult to spell, I accept, as a non-native speaker. Um, but uh, I think it's one that we could use. And then the second thing I'd like to mention is um, our brethren and sister organization ONE, who are doing some superb work with the veterans of the Defence Forces. There's currently a, a GoFundMe page to raise some badly needed fund for, funds for their efforts. And I, this has been a free seminar. Our outstanding speakers have contributed their time for free. So if anyone could contribute to ONE's fundraising, I think it would be good proxy for uh, the very high performance fees that these, these people deserve. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you very much to our panelists and we look forward to uh, having another webinar in the coming months. Thank you.